So it's nine o'clock and uh, thanks everybody for joining MLSA today for our 60th annual conference. And thanks for our, uh, to our sponsors for supporting this free event. My name's Mike Gallagher and I'm on the MLSA board and I get to host the meeting today. Uh, you're in uh, the session that will talk about Morrison Lake and phosphorus mitigation uh, with Jason Brokstra, who you see on the screen right now. And Jason, I wrote it down. I know you have a partner with you. Could you tell us his name? Uh, Scott Schuler. Scott is actually um, with CPRO Corporation and uh, he helped uh, prepare most of the presentation. Uh, we, we've been working on this Morrison Lake project for years, but Scott's gonna help me out with chat. So who, any oh. questions that come up with technical uh, questions, he'll be uh, answering those in chat as well as uh, Jamie Desjardins um, with PLM and she'll be an answering questions too in the chat box. Okay, wonderful. Folks, I'd like to let you know if you haven't already noticed your camera is turned off and your microphone is muted to help us reduce background noise and other distractions so that you, if you could please keep those settings that way, that would be helpful. Um, please feel free to click on chat at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there will be a box or panel that pops up for you to type in any questions you have during the presentation. And as Jason said, we'll be looking at those questions and then we'll be answering those towards the end of the, uh, the presentation. Um, Jason works with PLM and is currently uh, the Vice President of Michigan Operations and is an active board member. Jason's a past president of the Midwest Aquatic Plant Management Society, current Vice President of Michigan Aquatic Plant Managers Association and current secretary for the Michigan chapter, North American Lake Management Society. He's a recipient of the 2009 Applicator of the Year Award by CPRO Corporation. Jason also serves on the Michigan in the Lakes Partnership and many other organizations throughout Michigan. Jason, welcome today. Thanks, Mike. Okay, well, we're gonna have some fun. Um, we have 120 slides to go through today. I'm just kidding. We have 20 slides. Unfortunately, we, I'll probably do some rambling, um, but, uh, Hopefully it's gonna be educational. Uh, we're gonna talk about Morrison Lake, but I'm going to try to um, paint a bigger picture than just Morrison Lake in this discussion. And, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, as I mentioned already, uh, Scott and CPRO Corporation, as well as my staff, the Morrison Lake Improvement Board and many of the uh, Eagle um, um, ANC um, and other units within Eagle have been a big uh, help in putting this, this program together. Uh, Mike, something just happened and now my part just went away. Um, so it's starting to come back. All righty. With this many folks on, we seem to be a little slower. All right. Okay, so, I guess we'll let you get caught up there. Hey, that looks a little bit better. Yeah, I thought maybe that would took my chances, but here we go. Okay, next slide. All right, I'm too fast. Okay, so there. This is a phosphorus loading. These are some basics here. Um, I'm hoping we have a lot of riparians that are watching this. Locus Lake Association presidents, I know academia and people from uh, the state, but we'll cover some basics here. So just talking about phosphorus, uh, we all know we have our runoff and we have an industrial discharge. We have our from our sediments, resuspension of sediments. Uh, reloading uh, phosphorus into our lakes. And then we have precipitation. A lot of people don't think about all these different areas of phosphorus going into our lakes. This is normal. This is eutrophication. This is how our lakes eventually fill up. 
Now, it is influenced uh, exponentially by cultural eutrophication, our inputs. And that is something that I, I don't want to make light of. And there's a lot of uh, efforts that need to continue um, you know, with our water resources and education, our green belts, buffer strips, managing our watersheds, you know, rivers, lakes, and streams, phosphorus free fertilizers, all those things that we've, for decades, we've worked on our farmers, ag runoff, et cetera, they're critical. And throughout the presentation, I'll, I'll reference a few things that need to be done, but regardless to those efforts, uh, eutrophication is still gonna take place. And uh, that process uh, of the lakes aging needs to be considered. And what can we do to potentially slow that process down? And then of course, we have that resuspension of sediments and internal loading or just uh, the nutrients that are within, and then it brings up the big wake wake boat topic. So uh, we need to understand that sedimentation, um, all these things bring up the concept or the reality of, of eutrophication. Next slide. So phosphorus, eutrophication, what is your lake? Um, we're gonna talk about Morrison Lake specifically, but is your lake a beautiful torch lake and a ligotrophic lake? Um, you know, mesotrophic lake, here I'm talking to you from the Grand Rapids area. In more of our lakes in this area, we might see some mesotrophic, eutrophic status, um, real common where we have Morrison Lake that will be at some time a eutrophic, hypertrophic status where it's gonna have high phosphorus levels, high chlorophyll levels. Sometimes with a Carlson index, we'll look at our Secchi disc to indicate what our, our trophic statics is also. Uh, that means not a good water clarity and we, although we may have a lake that might be oligotrophic, have low phosphorus levels, tremendous water uh, clarity, we want to maintain that. So what can we do to keep it that way? Besides the practices uh, outside of our, our, the immediate lake itself, are there things that we can do to strip out phosphorus? So we don't always just need to look at the impaired water bodies. Uh, there might be other things that we can do to protect those lakes. There might be other things that we can do within a lake through a tributary, through an inlet, uh, uh, you know, trib or a, a channel that is the first area that might be a portion of a water body that might have more of a eutrophic uh, status versus the lake as a whole. So keep that in mind. What is going on with your lake? What's unique about your water body? Um, and not just think of just Morrison Lake is the example I'm going to explain to everybody here today. Next slide. Mike, next. Yep, yep, it's, uh, uh, come on. Afraid it's going to go through two or three slides here if I. Okay, no problem. Wow. You can see that picture, that division there. Of, oh, here we go. So, this is a, a huge component of what we're going to be discussing here today is new technology of FOSLOC, of how we can tie up phosphorus um, and, and reduce this critical ingredient to our lake's eutrophication process. FOSLOC is a naturally occurring element, element number 57. Um, it's the lanthanum is the, the uh, ingredient. 5% um, is it's lanthanum, 95% of, of the product is bentonite clay. Um, it comes in a 55 pound bag, but to put it in perspective, when we have 100 pounds of FOSLOC, this has the ability to bind with one pound of phosphorus. That doesn't seem like maybe a big deal, 100 pounds of this material, you'll be able to get one pound of, of phosphorus. But when you think about stripping one pound of phosphorus out of a lake, that one pound of phosphorus can support 500 pounds of algae growth. That is significant. And you'll see some other comparisons here as we move on, but that is a, a significant amount of algae, and that's a lot of, of phosphorus. Um, and it gives you a little bit of an idea here in those uh, illustrations of the phosphorus that is, is throughout your water column. 
uh, before application, the little blue dots there. And then we have phosphorus that is at the sediment layer. During the application of, of uh, FOSLOC, the product is applied at the surface. It does permeate throughout the water column, binding with phosphorus uh, as it uh, sinks down to the bottom. And then it makes this bond with the phosphorus at the sediment layer. This bond is very strong. It's a permanent bond with the phosphorus at the sediment layer. And as the sediment is moving at, right at that immediate sediment layer, there's additional binding that can take place. So that will make that lock and uh, phosphorus that is accumulated in the sediments for many years will have additional binding capacity. So not only are we stripping out new phosphorus that's entering into the water body, we have the ability to address the phosphorus that is accumulated in the sediments uh, over, over years also. So new technology, uh, naturally occurring element number 57, uh, very strong permanent binding uh, capabilities. Next slide. Okay. Technology. Everybody, a little coffee break. There we go. Well, I've hit the button, Jason. It's. Uh... I'm. It's given uh, Jamie and Scott time to maybe address some chat. Interesting. Yeah, tough one here. Oh, okay. I was afraid that was going to happen. Oh, boy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> one more. Okay. How about that? Okay, one more. There we go. Perfect. So, our uh, FOSLOC and, and the sediments. In this slide, um, we, needed to, we need to put things in perspective when we were working with the state of Michigan, trying to understand when we're applying this material, um, how much is going to go in the lake? And are we going to be filling the lake up with all this, this bentonite? Um, and it really was an extreme small amount of material that was required to, to strip out the phosphorus that we were, were trying to capture. So if we look at the... Um, the amount, if I'm looking at the graph here on, on the side, sediment, uh, you have a natural sedimentation in, in lakes. This is, uh, I think, we have a study here that back in 2010 that determined about three to five uh, millimeters per year of sedimentation takes place. And if we were using uh, FOSLOC at a heavy application rate, we'd have 0.38 millimeters of, of FOSLOC. That's, that would be the scale and perspective of how much uh, the thickness of that layer would be. And that's, you know, you, you can see it there, but it's still much less than what you would get in natural uh, sedimentation. Now, on Morgan Lake, we're, we're not doing a heavy FOSLOC application, uh, they, which is sometimes called a reset application. What we're doing is a mitigation. We're trying to strip out phosphorus uh, over time. So the application rate um, is was actually about... Um, 0 0.012 uh, millimeters thick, which a dollar bill, if you see down here in the bottom by the, the, the PLM logo there, um, is uh, 0 0.109 millimeters. So the actual thickness of the amount of FOSLOC that we were applying on Morrison Lake after all the applications uh, combined, there was multiple applications taking place during the 2000 season, was about 11% of a thickness of a dollar bill that was applied to Morrison Lake. And with the goals that you're gonna see that we accomplished uh, was significant. And the reality was the amount of material was insignificant in regards to the amount accumulating in the sediments. Um, and once again, this product was just bentonite clay. So it's not like we're putting something that's not natural uh, into the, bottoms of the, the bottom of the lake. Um, and also there's some the study has some um, reference to assisting with uh, making the sediments more stable with the use of FOSLOC. 
So that might be good too, to reduce uh, grease sedimentation in our lakes. Small mute point, but I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, next slide. Good luck, Mike. I'm so glad you're, you're moving the slides. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Okay, how's that? Terrific. Um, just a yeah. recap on phoslock. Um, terrific source. I mean, we're looking at phosphorus. We talked about phosphorus pollution for decades. Here is a new tool uh, that we can we can use. Um, trying to uh, you know use a tool that's directly re related to L uh, algae production. Uh, the state of Michigan, uh, many of you uh, know that we're trying to reduce the use of copper sulfate in our lakes. Um, if we can strip out our phosphorus and therefore reduce the need for algae treatments, uh, wonderful. This is another way of accomplishing that goal is to utilize this type of technology. Um, it's effective on a wide uh, range of uh, water chemistries versus like alum. Uh, sometimes if alum's used to uh, strip out um, uh, phosphorus, we need to use a, a buffered alum, which gets complicated sometimes. Um, let's see, uh, it, it's permanently binds, uh, resulting in the lanthanum phosphate, insolu insoluble, not bioavailable, non-toxic, and this is certified for drinking water. I think that's quite significant. It has been tested, it has been re uh, reviewed, it is safe for the environment and safe for drinking water. So. Wonder, wonderful toxicity package. Um, it's been around for a while. We've used this product for about 10 years and it's finally getting the, the traction that it, it, it needs um, and ex experience in our hands so we can put it into play and uh, help protect our lakes or improve our lakes. Next slide. So, it is important that people realize, and I, I don't want to make light of this, but this process, not only in the beginning of assessing the situation, the documentation required through our water quality analysis, looking at the watershed and, and talking with local entities and improving their watershed, and I'll, I'll probably touch on that a little bit later, um, but getting the data needed to understand how to best implement uh, Programs of this nature are very important. Um, working with the stakeholders, the riparians, uh, formulations of the lake boards, uh, going ahead and working with CPRO Corporation or whatever uh, entity it might be. The state of Michigan was very involved once again with the logistics of this program. Um, once that was accomplished and coming up with a prescription um, and the implementation process, uh, how we're going to get the materials there, the logistics, uh, making sure that the product is applied the correct way to achieve our goals. There is a lot involved here, but I, I think the most enjoy, the best part of all this is adaptive management is when you get through these steps and you're seeing this success, the adaptive management is, is when you're accomplishing your goals You've looked at what you've achieved, and now it's like, what next? How do we modify this, this program to continue um, making progress and moving forward? And that whole process just continues on, working with the riparians, stakeholders, uh, you know, state agencies, et cetera. And um, it's ongoing. That's, that's our life. That's what we do here. And uh, it makes things fun. Next slide. All right, so here's, uh, we'll talk a little bit more specifics on Morrison Lake, now that we got you guys up to speed on a little bit on Foslock. Um, so Morrison Lake, we've been working out there for many years. I've been doing this for over 25 years. Um, and Morrison Lake was a lake we've been involved with managing for probably, I don't know, 30 or so. But so this study, um, 330 acre lake, uh, Clarksville, Michigan, um, impaired with phosphorus pollution, struggling for, for decades. Um, 
we had some heightened uh, concerns here back in 2019, I think it was, with some harmful algae blooms, HABs. Uh, we've all heard of them here in recent years, more so than maybe a decade or so ago. And then they had a, 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 the TMDLs, the totally maximum daily loads. Uh, that was, that was a, a state uh, mandated, um, we needed to reduce the amount of phosphorus that was in Morrison Lake. Um, it was an impaired water body. And it's a list, a, a short list of lakes in the state of Michigan that was somewhat dictated that we need to make a change out here. We need to reduce the amount of phosphorus that's coming into this lake and that will be referenced a little bit here in this case study and uh, used as a goal of, of what uh, we want to accomplish. Next slide. So here's that uh, nasty little sign that had to be posted up at the access site um, Back in 2019, the lake did have to be shut down a few times. It was rather unsightly. Um, I believe it was more microcystis blooms that they had out there um, to the extent that the, no swimming, uh, no contact uh, was taking place for a few days. Um, pretty intense situation. Uh, so the phosphorus mitigation program, we had uh, Two main drains out there. I think there's a couple other small tributaries that come in. We have the Leary drain, uh, the Stewart drain, and then we have our deep water zone, waters greater than 15 feet that's under the thermocline. That's uh, what we're referencing is internal loading areas. That's that water that becomes anoxic uh, midsummer. And once water becomes anoxic, no oxygen present, then the phosphorus releases from the sediments. Uh, and then pulls up underneath that thermocline, and that's what is called internal loading versus external loading, which is the water that comes from our, our watershed through the Leary drain and Stewart um, drain. So most of us might know that, I'm not sure. Um, anyways, uh, 2019, we have the HAB advisories that took place. So what we decided to do is uh, move in with this, this program, reducing the phosphorus. Um, we were gonna do a different program that would had been done in previous years, which I'll touch on here in a little bit, and do monthly applications of FOSLOC. Um, and we we're gonna try to meet our established TMDL standards, which was a removal of 538 pounds of phosphorus. Remember we talked about FOSLOC and what 100 pounds would do is take out one pound of, of phosphorus, uh, phosphorus. And now we have this established uh, 538 pounds, which was determined off the data that we collected actually with the conservation district study we did back in 2006. So just a little reference there. Um, so why do we want to do this? Of course, is we want to reduce this phosphorus so we can reduce this algal bloom issues that we're having. We want to improve their secchi disc readings. We Morrison Lake has had secchi disc that probably average on a three feet, which is not good. I've seen Morrison Lake put my hand in, in the water after six inches and it's gone. Um, so when you have conditions like this for decades of maybe when water clarity is good, you know, briefly, maybe you'll have a six or seven feet secchi, but when you have consistent times when you're only at three feet and then other times where it's only a foot or two, you cannot promote and, and maintain a, a native plant community. And so they've lost that stability of native plants. So over time, we need to get stability with their water quality out there, clarity. So their littoral zone that supports aquatic plants can expand into deeper waters and we can recover that, those, those native species. Uh, unfortunately, their seed bank is probably, it has diminished uh, and we'll be working with other partners to maybe do some plantings and restoration of native plants in the future. Little tangent there, but next slide. This is my creative slide. <laughs> Another example of why Morrison Lake is, is unique. Um, it's an ag area, uh, you know, it, it's very fertile. Um, we have a, a golf course up there by the Leary drain. There'll be another in a second. We'll show you where these drains are or the inlets. Uh, 
we have a sod farm at the Stewart drain, Lucky Morrison Lake. Uh, we have cattle, a uh, huge cattle um, uh, area of, you can see where they're located. Farming all around is beautiful. Um, it's a very rich, productive area. And so despite, you know, all the inputs that taking place here with the, the, the cultural eutrophication that's here, God uh, made Morrison Lake in fertile grounds. So eutrophication is always going to be more of a component, more exponential than, than other lakes, period. Um, so we, we got to remember that. This is just a different water body. It's fertile. Now, the farmers have taken into consideration no-till practices over the decades. They realize that they want to protect their, their jewel here, Morrison Lake. Uh, the golf course has been using phosphorus-free fertilizers and practicing things to protect that lake for a long time. They've been trying to work with their, the lake board. The, the uh, farmer with the cattle, years ago, they used to come down to the water's edge. Those practices have changed before my time. Um, so people are working together to try to protect this lake. Um, the lake board has put in retention ponds in the Leary drain, uh, sediment retention ponds, which do make a difference, um, buffering out some phosphorus, but they're still, uh, they're still getting high levels um, coming into the lake. But efforts have been made, but this is a fertile lake. So I, I just want to paint the picture. This may not be your lake. Uh, people are trying to be good stewards, but Mother Nature this, this is just a, a unique situation. Next slide. This is the data that we collected in 2006 that was utilized to formulate the 2008 uh, TMDL data. So we worked with the conservation district and uh, looking at the, the Leary drain and Stewart drains on a monthly basis, daily basis. I remember being out there in the rain. I think we had flow meters running, capturing samples for phosphorus levels. Regardless, uh, the data was, um, we determined, you know, what kind of phosphorus levels were coming in through those drains. And uh, on the bottom there, you can look at the total phosphorus load and and getting a 75% reduction of that, we have that 538 pounds reduction goal. And that's where that's derived from. Derived from. So this is, um, that's just giving you an example where that, that number came from. There's a bunch of data that we've collected uh, years before 2006 and, and after, um, but this was a little bit more intense uh, just looking at those, those tributaries. Um, we have a lot more in lake water quality data that we'll look at here in a second. Next slide. I did have a, um, a video here. It just, it wouldn't work. Um, so I just threw in some, some pictures. Of course, the, uh, the permit process, I briefly talked about that working with Eagle and this um, permit to use this product uh, ultimately needed a rule 97 approval. Um, so that was acquired. Um, and once again, that we have another one of those permits here for the 2021 season. Um, the application process, um, prior to going out, we have, uh, the lake is broken up. You can't see everything on that map, but we have things predetermined um, with a, a, a GIS grid uh, format, we break the lake up into three different sections and we have these uh, GPS tracks laid out. So each of the applicators knows exactly where the product's going to be applied and um, then uh, how much product is going to go down, how much you know, material needs to go in each one of those sections. So we have that laid out on a, on a map and they have it on, downloaded into their GPSs on their boats. Uh, so everything is done precisely. Um, the material there, you can see that one picture, it comes in a, a bag, 55 pounds per bag. Uh, we put it into a, a, a spray system, um, a 55 gallon, um, you know, a, a spray tank and mix it in 
with maybe like a slurry, I guess. And then it is spread uh, by a swath, a surface application. Our boom sprays can get about 50 foot swath, 50 to 60 foot swath. And we'll just go ahead and evenly spray that back and forth, back and forth, trying to get the best coverage that we can. Therefore, getting the surface waters permeating down throughout the water column and trying to capture as much phosphorus as, as we can. And then it will eventually go ahead and bond on the uh, sediment layer also. Um, so just give you a little snapshot of what it kind of looks like in that process of getting a permit, some pre-work that's done in the office and what it looks like out in the field. Next slide. So this is um, interesting, at least I think so. Uh, you can see on the, on the right there, it gives you a column of the treatment dates. Now we wanted to do this treatment a little earlier than than June 2nd, uh, COVID got in the way of that and a few other things getting the permit in hand. Uh, we wanted to do the treatment in May, but we initiated things here with a, the first application uh, in on June 2nd, 10,000 pounds of uh, FOSLOC was applied. And you can see that every two to three weeks, uh, additional applications were performed in the quantity of product that was utilized. And as we got through the season, uh, less product was used, uh, mainly because we didn't have as much rainfall taking place and uh, we anticipated using less product as uh, we got through through the latter part of the year. Now, this graph uh, will hopefully make sense in here in a second. This is late summer deep hole phosphorus levels. Now, the deep hole is going to be a sample that's going to be under the thermocline. This is after the, the waters have become anoxic. So we're using a Van Dorn bottle. We're dropping a, a bottle under the thermocline, capturing that anoxic water, waters that we know are going to be polluted with high levels of, of phosphorus. And we can go back here for till uh, back to 2007. And we have 200 uh, micrograms per liter of phosphorus under the thermocline, which is pretty high. Um, and 2008, I don't know why this it should be a red dot there. In 2008, we did, and well, we didn't do it, but we were uh, part of the program and an alum treatment was uh, performed at that time. And similar idea that we're stripping out phosphorus. We had a high phosphorus levels. They were having some algae issues. And so alum was applied. It was done in a different, different intent. Um, alum was also applied prior to 2008. I don't remember it, what year it was, if it was in the 90s or something like that. But so when the alum was applied, um, it was done uh, one treatment. It, take, it maybe took a couple days to get the, the product applied. Um, it wasn't applied uh, as much of a focus to all the immediate extreme shallow waters, but um, it was an attempt to address internal loading and not capture all the external loading that was coming into the lake, you know, on a, you know, throughout the season. Um, it was very, it was effective. You can see after the application in 2008, uh, we were under uh, 100 micrograms per liter. So after that treatment took place, over time, uh, we anticipated that the phosphorus levels uh, would increase, and they did. Um, and we knew that someday we were going to have to do another alum treatment. Yeah, the board was aware of that, the residents were aware of that, and we weren't sure how long that was going to be. A lot of that's based on mother nature. Um, so when we got into 2012, 2013, you know, those numbers under the thermocline, uh, we're, we're hot. You know, we're 700, 800 micrograms per liter. That's, that's extremely high. I mean, most lakes don't see levels that high. Um, my recollection was surprisingly the numbers were high, but the lake was still doing okay. We weren't having serious HAB issues. And um, although we were preparing ourselves to collect money for another alum treatment, then all of a sudden, uh, I don't know if it was low water levels, I don't recall. Um, we had a, a reduction in, in some of that phosphorus numbers. Um, the lake was still doing okay, 2014, 2015, that we had a, a drop there in 2015 for around 200 micrograms per liter. Once again, that's really high, but things were hanging in there. 
uh, come 2017, 2018, we're working with the Lake Board, going through public hearings, gathering up funds to do another alum treatment, but we're also considering Foslock. We're looking at this technology, thinking maybe there's a different way to do this. We're also looking at alum. Maybe there's a different way to use alum to be more effective. And we're working with consultants. Um, we're working, uh, had some dialogue with GBSU. And um, so in the meantime, it's around that 2018, 2019, and we're getting ready to pull the trigger to do another treatment. And then we get the, the cost for alum and it was almost triple, not quite triple the cost what we had back in 2008. We, we didn't have the, there wasn't the money to do that. And so we had to cross our fingers and hope that we'd get through another year in 2019 without having any serious issues. Well, and for the most part in 2019, uh, we got through most of July and it was August and boom, it hit. And our blue greens were an issue. Uh, we were having blue greens across the state. The media hype was, you know, I wouldn't even call it media hype. You know, there was blue greens in more lakes than we've seen in the past. A lot of that was probably a factor of the high water levels. Watersheds weren't uh, filtering as much. Uh, we just, uh, we had we had some problems going on. And um, so uh, we decided to look even closer at the use of FOSLOC and uh, we implemented um, the use of FOSLOC, but not doing a one and done application. We knew that we not only needed to address a little bit of the internal loading, but the significant amount of So that's why we did the, the multiple applications. Every few weeks we would treat, so we're capturing the new phosphorus that's coming in from the watershed, stripping that phosphorus out, and plus getting additional binding at the sediment layer every time we do a treatment. So you can see in 2020, after we did, now we did have some blue grains right off the bat in May of 2020, um, but we, we did some treatments with algicides. We did our uh, FOSLOC application and the lake uh, did respond well. Uh, by the end of the year, when we got into August, we didn't have to treat the lake. It didn't have any algae uh, issues. Um, and our phosphorus numbers were, were less than what we had in 2008. It was impressive. Um, it, it, it met our expectations. Um, Next slide. Oh. Okay. Is that the one you're looking for? I don't know. It looks like did something go out of order? We missed that one earlier. This let, let's yeah. yeah, I somehow that got missed. Just we'll just look at this for a second. This is a uh, um, map showing these sample sites. Um, the little D down there, that's that Stewart drain. That was the one coming from the, directly from the sod farm. Um, C was the deep hole. I think it might get around 30 feet deep there. It's a pretty small deep hole. Um, B, um, that's where the Leary drain comes in. And then you can see those uh, retention ponds that the, the lake board implemented a couple decades ago, and then E is another sample site. When we do our samples um, from E and B, we do see a significant reduction in phosphorus because of those ponds, but still uh, the amount of phosphorus coming in um, at, the, at B is usually around 200 micrograms per liter. We're still getting significant external load coming there, but we have also seen at the E site around 1,000 micrograms per liter. So it's we're getting stripping from the ponds, um, but there's still a, a tremendous amount of phosphorus coming in uh, from the external load. So yeah, that slide, I think we somehow skipped over that earlier. I think I've gone <laughs> backwards. Let's yeah. Break, for me at least. Let's see, we're looking for, where are we? We want to get to, that's the one. Okay. Oh, back, back up. 
back up. All right, so another summary bar graph here. This is uh, based on June samples. Um, not quite as high in numbers, but it's the same type of illustration um, in, our, in our phosphorus. Representing, uh, here we just have a snapshot of 2018, 19, and 20. And uh, this is our, our, our June location. We're still having um, internal loading. Their oxygen depletion under the thermocline is, it has taken place uh, typically on Morrison Lake at this, at this time. And we have an 80% uh, reduction in, in phosphorus. It's quite significant. And our measurements, um, what we're looking at in reduction for the 2020 season is about 300 pounds of phosphorus. Our goal was 538. Um, we're working towards it. It was significant. And um, in getting that 300 pounds, we can see the impacts that we had on the ecosystem. And uh, that was no HABs. I mean, there's still blue greens out there, but not a, a, enough blue greens to cause a shutdown to the lakes, um, visual improvements, water clarity improvements, et cetera. But there's more work to be done. And uh, the program with FOSLOC will continue into 2021. Actually, the FOSLOC program is, is a three-year pilot. Uh, we'll be doing um, that, a similar program in 2022. We'll live and learn, maybe some slight modifications. But we're also going to be, I have a, a parenthesis there, um, Utrasorb. There's a, another product that we've been talking from the beginning of this, of these tributaries. What more can we do inside these tributaries to further reduce phosphorus before it gets into Morrison Lake? So I'm going to move on to a, another element additional management that we're proposing um, at this time to the state of Michigan for consideration on Morrison Lake. Next slide. I'm looking at my clock, so I'm gonna have to hurry here. <clears throat> All right, Utrezorb. This is a um, different uh, mineral. It's not lanthanum, but other naturally occurring minerals that have binding capacity with phosphorus. Um, works well uh, complementing our ongoing FOSLOC programs. Great tool to be used in uh, watershed BMPs. Um, offset the issues with HABs. If we can monitor, monitor or reduce phosphorus before it enters our lakes, uh, therefore reduce the potential for harmful algae blooms, terrific. Um, it's Ecologically benign, it's not, it's not going to impact uh, the environment, uh, the use of this mineral. Um, it probably not really knowing what Utrezorb is yet, but it's this, this product is a mineral that is in these bags. It's a 25 pound bag um, that's it's, uh, porous, but doesn't uh, and permeable. But when water permeates through the bag, um, the material does not leave the bag, but has the ability to strip the phosphorus as it penetrates through. Um, there may have been materials similar to this in the past, but this is new technology and it is very effective in stripping phosphorus. Um, so you'll see a couple more pictures here in a second. A wonderful, uh oh, and also it can be used, these bags that we, they can be placed in farm fields for recycling purposes, et cetera, if necessary. Um, so stormwater, all these new developments uh, or other, you know, lakes with, uh, uh, you know, just tributaries and things. We're working through some, some of these questions with the state of Michigan right now, TMDLs, MPDS discharge questions, any way that we can improve our water bodies and re reduce phosphorus, we want to look at these technologies that are available to us and Nutrisorb is, is one of these new technologies. Next slide. So on Morrison Lake, that's circling that channel um, of the Leary drain. And what we're proposing to do is add a hundred of these filters. You can see that little bag there. And it doesn't look like much, but it, it, it's, it works. And if we can strip out more phosphorus before it actually gets to the lake, well, then you know what, we're gonna 
evaluate this, this product and, and what it can do. So that's about 1300 feet. Um, so therefore 100 bags, which is about one bag per 13 feet, uh, a, a limited quantity of bags that's not gonna disrupt flow and create erosion issues. Um, we'd be evaluating phosphorus levels pre, post, and during the, the process of uh, using these bags. Uh, additional 84 bags would be introduced um, sometime in July. And once again, uh, evaluation would continue uh, throughout the summer months. Um, next slide. By doing this, our goal would be to get another 50 pounds of, uh, of phosphorus removed, therefore 350 uh, pounds of phosphorus mitigation. That would be wonderful. Whatever we can do to continue to reduce the load on Morrison Lake, uh, improve that water clarity, quality, um, that's what we want to do, is just bring this lake back to stability, you know, monitor, assess, and, and adaptively manage this, this, uh, this ecosystem. 2022, we'll, we'll, we'll see what it brings to us, what our options are. Um, I think uh, I had already said the last bullet point there. I have one more closing statement. We'll have a few minutes for questions. Next slide. Um, talking about eutrophication here, um, uh, big picture, I'll be real quick here. 25% of the Michigan lakes uh, are eutrophic and majority of the reason is uh, because of phosphorus. And this is going back to the TMDL lakes that have been determined by the lake, uh, state of Michigan as uh, impaired water bodies. Next slide. Missing something there. We skipped over something, but I don't want to go back, Mike. It's fine. Okay. We're, we're, there's a bunch of lakes out there that are, you know, on that list of, of eutrophic, hyper eutrophic water bodies that are in need of, of uh, you know, tools like Foslock and, and Nutrisorb. I'm not sure where your lake stands, but, you know, we need to look at this technology and uh, use it to our advantage, protect those lakes that are desperately in need, but look at the lakes that maybe not be desperate, but if we can protect those lakes and uh, reduce that phosphorus before it becomes a problem, let's do it. This slide is, is showing um, the increased frequency of harmful algae blooms, hot topic. Water levels are coming down a little bit. I'm optimistic that maybe our, our, our wetlands would have a little bit better buffering capacity of our, our nutrients. Maybe HABs won't be as much of an issue this year. I don't know. The durations of summer, uh, the length of summer is, is still a problem. Uh, the, duration, the, the thermoclines developing sooner is allowing our, our lakes to go you know, anoxic sooner, which therefore can turn into you know, having more phosphorus loading, internal loading taking place. So this references the complaints acknowledged by the state of Michigan uh, on HABs. Whether or not it's awareness, people just are more familiar with HABs. We don't think so. It, we think maybe it is true that HABs are becoming more of an issue. I kind of agree. Um, we'll see what Mother Nature throws at us this year. But the fact is we have an piece of technology that might be able to help us with phosphorus. That's where I'm going with this. So keep that in mind um, and uh, think about these new tools. So I'm going to stop talking. I think the last slide has contact for me and Scott, and maybe we have a little bit of time for questions. And Jason, um, I think Scott is checking the chat, so we'll leave it up to him to ask you the questions. Great. Uh, maybe I have to unmute him. Yeah, no, I am. Uh, I'm here. Oh, good. I think I've answered many of the questions. Um, Jamie and I have answered many of the questions um, with Within the chat already, there were uh, several questions about um, is uh, FOSLOC registered by FIFRA? 
And the answer to that is no, FIFRA is a process for registering pesticides. Phosloc is not a pesticide. Um, pesticides control pests um, and generally the word side, side will kill, kill something. Uh, Phosloc restores water quality. Uh, there were questions about, uh, do you need an applicator's license? Um, in most states, you do not need an applicator's license to apply Phosloc as it is not a pesticide. Uh, you may need permits to apply Phosloc to a water body. And I think Jamie um, described that. Um, you do need a Rule 97 approval from Eagle um, to apply Phosloc to a public waterway in the state of Michigan. Uh, I believe there was, uh, there were questions about um, alum and its cost effectiveness versus Phosloc. Um, I would just say that that's highly variable depending upon the, you know, extreme variability we have from lake to lake. I believe so far in for Morrison Lake specifically that Phosloc has shown to be very cost effective. Uh, yeah, that's that's absolutely correct, Scott. Um, we've uh, been able to incorporate the use of Phosloc into a three-year program, and as I mentioned briefly, that we love the concept that we're we're utilizing this not just uh, one time to address internal loading, but we're all being able to mitigate the external load you know, based on rainfall events you know, on a every few week basis for the next three years. So um, yeah, the, the, uh, the program, um, their budget has allowed that versus just doing it one time only with Alan, which we didn't have the money to do. The, um, there were some questions about uh, laminar flow aeration. Um, and uh, I believe Jamie addressed that. Um, that was considered with Dr. Steinman um, and determined not to be a, as, as beneficial of a, as a, of a management tool for this specific site uh, compared to trying to mitigate um, phosphorus with a phosphorus binder. Um, there were also some questions about does the phos or does the bentonite impact spawning grounds? And as Jason mentioned, um, you know, we're talking about it, particularly at Lake at Morrison Lake, it was less than a tenth of a millimeter. Um, we're generally applying Phosloc. It builds a layer on the bottom less than a millimeter in thickness and shouldn't have any kind of impact on spawning grounds. Uh, pH does not impact the binding capacity of, of Phosloc. Um, within um, you know natural conditions, you would find in most lakes. Uh, let's see, it looks like some new questions are coming in. Scott, I'm so happy you're doing all this chat stuff. <laughs> uh, Not as happy as I am. <laughs> there's a question, um, Jamie, that you may want to um, address for Jason. Um, what group or agency can we reach out to to determine if we should go with lamellar flow aeration or consider Phosloc. Um, yeah, I guess you could talk with some people at Eagle and certainly consultants or PLM. Jason, I'll let you take that. Yeah, we'd probably be able to review the situation with them initially. Um, I'm not sure if the state's gonna be able to provide opinions one way or another on that, but we have experiences in, in all those areas so we could help them out. Uh, the question is, um, are, one is, are these slides available? Um, I'll let Mike or Jason answer that. Uh, is there a buildup of Phosloc with numerous applications? Uh, again, the, uh, the, the total uh, layer that um, Jason spoke about that was uh, less than the thickness of a dollar bill, that was all the uh, Phosloc applied over the course of the year, all those applications he showed. So um, over the three year period, we're still talking about a layer of Phosloc that's less than a millimeter um, in thickness. Uh, but yes, um, you do build up, um, I mean, that material does not leave the lake once you put it into the lake. Yeah, these, all that's been reviewed in depth with the uh, 
wetland lakes and streams unit um, to make sure that we didn't have a, a fill uh, concern on, on their end. So that was uh, reviewed quite a bit. There's a question about, are you able to share the annual budget for the Fosslock treatments from JC Garrison? Um, and I, you know, we can, you can address that with her directly in the chat or, um, or as you feel. Yeah, we reach out with us independently and, and we'll talk to you about that. And as for sharing these screens, I believe Melissa talked with everybody who is making a presentation today. And I think all the PowerPoints and the screens uh, will be made available through MLSA probably on our website. Is, is that what you heard also, Jason? Is yes, yours available? It is, there's a PDF that's on the website um, and this is being recorded. So all this is gonna be available. Uh, there's a question about the percentage of eutrophic lakes in Michigan, 25%, and, and, and then it said 17% are due to phosphorus. Is that 17% <clears throat> 25? Uh, I believe it's 17% of lakes are classified as eutrophic in Michigan for phosphorus, not 17% of the 25%. Um, Folks, we have just a few minutes left. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat. And, uh, uh, but I think we only have three or four minutes to go. There's a question about, uh, we are looking specifically at benthic, not water surface or water column algae. Would Fosslock have any role in this type of problem? Um, again, Fosslock is not an algicide. So, you know, Jason and his team would need to know specifically what type of, of benthic algae and what the source of the problem is from a water quality perspective. So I don't know if Fosslock would have a fit in that or not. Yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, if we're dealing with <clears throat> oscillatoria or, or some type of benthic problem, um, you know, we're living and learning, you know, even with, with starry stonewort, you know, I, I have another project we're working on with uh, Foslock, and although it's not our, our direct goal um, to have impacts on Starry, this, this water body does have Starry stonewort in the vicinity of the application. And I'm interested to see if there's any impacts, uh, reductions in growth where the, you know, the, on the Starry, but benthic algae like Ossetoria, you know, we're still living and learning. So if you have a, a project, we can talk with you about it. Okay, how are we doing on the questions? Did that just about wrap it up or? Um, there is another question that's come in. Um, in the Michigan Corps presentation yesterday, eutrophic lakes were described as natural. What are the con contraindications for applying this material? When would you not apply it? Um, well, um, eutrophic lakes, can be natural. Um, many of our eutrophic lakes are um, in that condition due to um, man-made impacts. So that process has been sped up significantly um, or the amount of phosphorus has been increased um, significantly through um, our impacts on the watershed. So um, it depends on the management goals. Um, it, it really comes down to the condition of the lake and the management goals of those charged with managing the lake um, that would lead to that decision. So it, it's going to vary as much as, as there'll be as many answers to that as there are lakes in Michigan. Yeah, that's a philosophy, you know, of, of eutrophic is natural, but eutrophication is natural, but that doesn't mean we can't try to slow down the process of eutrophication. So interesting. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. Jason and Scott, really appreciated you joining us today. It was a super interesting uh, presentation and it's so nice to hear of some brand new technology that's out there. Um, so thanks very much. And folks, thanks for joining us at, at this presentation. The next one will start, there'll be a choice of two. Next presentations are at 10.15. 
And please check your agenda for the links uh, to those two sessions. Um, when I, before I close the meeting, I will try to put the agenda into the chat room and it'll only be there for a moment uh, when I do have to uh, end the chat or end the uh, session. So you'll be able to find it there for just a minute or two. Okay, thanks again. We'll see you all later. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone.